Awesome, thank you so much. So now we'll go ahead and get started. Oh, thank you for someone who said that the links didn't come through on the chat. Um, I will send those again. These are just some helpful links that um, I might reference throughout the presentation and I'll link to some good information for you to have in case you're interested in going solar. So now without further ado, let's go through how solar works. So here's a simple graphic portraying a solar system. Um, here on the left, we have the photovoltaic panel. This is the panel that um, absorbs the power of the sun and creates a volt of electricity. That volt, volt of electricity is then sent to a special device called an inverter or microinverter that converts the electricity generated from the solar panel, which is direct current electricity, to alternating current or AC electricity that can be used by your home. From there, it then flows into your home's electrical panel to power anything in your home from your computer, Wi-Fi, TV, fridge, or charging electrical vehicle. If at any point in time you're generating more power than your home is using, then here in Oregon, when you get solar, you get a new utility meter that allows that power to flow out to the grid, allowing you to have a grid-tied solar system. This meter also allows you to pull power from the grid um, in the event that you are not producing enough electricity to cover the power you are needing at any given time. Um, we will be talking about all these all these all of these components in more detail throughout the presentation, but here is just a simple overview. So first off, that special device I mentioned called the inverter. There are two types of inverters typically installed in Oregon, and both of them are a great option just depending on your system and your budget. The first off is an inverter pictured on the left. This is usually placed on the outside of your home and it absorbs all the power from the solar panels at once and converts it all at once. Um, this is installed on the outside room and as I said, it can be a great option. The other option is a micro inverter, which is pictured here on the right. These absorb the power from just one or two solar panels at a time and convert just that small amount of power to then flow into your home. So instead of having just one inverter, as you would with the inverter on the left, if you have a 10 panel system, you could have up to 10 microinverters for your solar system. As I said, both are great options. It really just depends on your system and your budget. As you'll see, solar systems are highly customizable and modular. So speaking with your solar installer about what you want out of your system is a great way to get the best Thing for you. Now, solar panels that we typically see around um, Portland, which I saw from the demographic survey is where most people are from, are roof-mounted solar panels. That's pictured here on the left. This is solar mounted on your roof. This goes on top of your roof and is not a roofing product. Um, these solar panels are a great option as it doesn't take any extra space and your roof is usually in the sun for most of the day. Another option if you do have the space, so if you're farther out in the country or not in a densely populated area, are ground mounted solar panels. Um, these are solar panels that, as the name implies, are mounted on the ground. <clears throat> these can be a little bit more expensive because you do need to run conduit lines from the ground mount to your home, but they can be a great option if you have the space. Now, as I said, roof-mounted solar panels are not a roofing product. However, another great option are solar roof tiles. This is solar that is your roof, so it is both a solar panel that generates power and a roofing product that helps protect your home from the elements. There are several brands available. However, this is still a very new product, and as such, the price point is very high. When, If you are interested in this, though, it is important to find a contractor who is installed them before and make sure they are familiar with it as it is a newer product and you want to be sure your home is being adequately protected from the elements. And price declines are unpredictable. They've been predicted to be coming for many years now and yet haven't quite come to fruition. Now, as I said, when you get a solar system, you would also get a new utility meter. This is called a bi-directional meter that allows power to flow in both directions so that you can get power coming into your home from the grid and also export power to the grid from your solar panel if you are generating more power than you need. The system that makes this possible is called net metering and we're gonna go through how this works. 
So to do so, we're going to look at two examples. First, in a typical sunny summer month, you will be gaining credit. So if we look at this orange bar on the left, you'll see how much power your solar is producing, which is pretty high because it's nice and sunny out, it's nice and hot, There's, the days are longer. However, your grid consumption is only about half of that power you are producing. Therefore, all that excess power you're producing just goes out to your grid to your neighbors in order to allow them to access renewable power, which is a great option. And for that power you are exporting, you will earn net metering credits. These will appear on your bill and we'll be looking at a bill example on the next slide. And those credits will build up throughout the summer. Net metering credits do roll over from month to month. So those credits, as I said, build over, so build up all summer. And then when we get to the cold winter months, days are shorter, there's not as much sun, and your solar production goes down. Now your solar production is about half of what you need, and yet as your consumption has stayed about the same. Therefore, you need to draw more power from the grid. Um, however, you built up all those net metering credits throughout the month, and currently here in Oregon, we have a one-to-one -one trade. So as you consume power from the grid in the winter, you are then spending those net metering credits. So what does this look like in practice? We're going to look at a bill in order to see. So here's a typical bill. We can see on the left the um, period for which you are being billed, the net metering um, read at the beginning of the month and the net metering read at the end of the month and how much credit, how much, how many credits you have generated throughout this month. Calculated in yellow, you can see that the net period usage is negative 327, meaning that you generated, that this customer generated 327 um, net metering credits in order to spend during the winter, which has been added to their year to date bank excess generation. Um, you can see that number highlighted here on the left, and their billable kilowatt hours are zero. Now, it is important to note that net metering credits roll over from month to month, but they do not roll over from year to year. That means your net metering credits build up all year, and then you should spend them all winter. An important thing to note with your solar system is you want to size it in order to meet but not exceed your usage for that exact reason. The net metering year lasts in, begins in March and ends at the end of February. Um, so now, while you have billable, zero billable kilowatt hours, you can see that the um, amount due on the bill is not zero. This is because just to be connected to the grid, you do have some taxes and fees. This means your the electricity bill for this customer would be $12.63 for the month. Now, while it's disappointing that your power bill will be zero, um, the average utility bill in Oregon is around $70, and that is increasing year to year. While this number and this number is quite a bit less, so you're still getting a good amount of savings. So now, as I said, your system should be sized based on how much electricity you consume. <clears throat> you want to size your system in order to meet but not exceed your expected usage so that you're not ex ending up having to forfeit a large number of net metering credits at the end of each year. Um, other factors to consider are available space, budget, and aesthetics, but you'll want to talk to your solar contractor about how much electricity you consume and if you have any major changes planned that would impact your electricity usage. This can include uh, anyone moving in or out of your home and um, or the purchase of an electric vehicle or other electrical appliances. The average size of a system here in Oregon is about 8 kilowatts. So now, how do you know if your home is right for solar? So here in Oregon, no matter where you are in the state, you have enough solar access. Here in this diagram, we can see the two arcs of the sun at the highest point in the year, the summer solstice and the winter solstice. We can see that no matter what, as long as your roof has some south-facing solar access, you can get a good amount of sun. Um, here in Oregon, typically solar panels are installed on all directional roof planes except north-facing roof planes. Um, but southwest, east, southwest, and southeast planes are all perfectly fine. Um, now, even if you have a really great south-facing roof plane, something that can 
inhibit your ability to go solar is shade. We don't want to cut down all these great trees, though, but if your roof is heavily shaded, you will not be a great candidate for solar. But accept that enjoy your great, lovely, big trees that you have and maybe look into other options such as community solar in order to see if that would be a better option for you. Another thing to consider is roof complexity. Ideally, you have a nice, simple roof plane, nice, simple, continuous roof plane that solar can be installed on. Here on the right, we can see what that looks like, where there is an entire roof plane that a system can be installed in in one continuous fashion. Yet here on the left, there's a complex roof where even if a lot of those roof planes are facing south, the solar system would have to be broken up into smaller pieces, which would just limit the number of solar panels that could be had overall and um <clears throat> and lead and cost more money due to extra materials being needed. Hmm. Now another thing to consider is your roof condition age. It is recommended that you have over 20 years of life of roof life left. This is because in order to get solar panels you will in order to re-roof your home, you will need to take your solar panels off your roof and then reinstall them. This just adds extra cost and is better to be avoided as if your solar panels could break during this process. If you have an old roof, we recommend you wait until after you re-roof in order to get solar. And now if you are getting rooftop solar, something to consider is whether or not your roof can support solar. Um, here in Portland, Oregon, a lot of the older, really gorgeous colonial homes we have only have rafters in their roof. The rafters may not be able to support the added weight of solar panels and may require some extra engineering in order to be able to go solar. Um, trusses, like pictured here on the left, would need to be added. Um, this can be done, however, just leads to some extra engineering costs and some extra proof. If you have a newer built home, odds are you probably have trusses and would be able to get go solar without that added cost. Now let's look at solar and storage. Now solar and storage are complementary technologies that allow you as a consumer to have energy resilience. This means you would be able to have power when the grid is down. Solar makes storage more effective and storage allows you to access your solar power when the grid is down. Um, without storage, you are unable to access solar even if you have it on your roof. Um, here's just a quick example of what that can look like. So we have a battery pack pictured here in the garage and solar panels on the roof. Now, why would you want to have energy resilience? As I said, energy resilience is the ability to use power when the grid is down. Um, this can be because of short frequent outages, such as those caused by storms and squirrels. I know a lot of us here in Oregon this week are preparing for the snowstorm that's being predicted and winter storms and are kind of banking on there being probably some power outages as a result of that. Um, other reasons for outages can be public safety power shutoff. The first of these happened in Oregon in 2020. That is when the grid is shut down in order to decrease the likelihood of a fire breaking out. And lastly, there is the Cascadia seismic hazard, which predicts that the Willamette Valley could lose power for up to three weeks and even longer out on the coast. Now, when it comes to picking a battery, there are many brands and chemistries available, and some installers may specialize in one specific battery. It is important to note that if you already have one battery, say a Tesla Powerwall, you cannot get a second battery from a different brand. You will need to continue with that same brand that you started with. Your solar panels and your battery can be different brands, so. Um, and it, lastly, it is important to note the limitations of batteries. So when picking out a battery, you want to be realistic about how long you want to back your home up for and how long your battery will last. Um, a battery, if you are running a lot on your battery, it's going to be depleted quickly and there's no guarantee that it will be able to be recharged. If you've lost power due to a storm in the middle of winter, it might still be storming and your solar panels not, might not be able to get any sun as an example. So one common solution is using a partial home backup rather than a whole home backup. Um, this is when some of your um, power out
cabinets and sections of your home are put on a separate breaker panel that will draw power from the battery in the event of an outage, while the rest of your home will lose power. So really the question when looking, here's an example of the essential loads panel. Um, your breakers are moved to the new additional panel. This does add complexity and cost, but can allow your battery can, to last longer overall. Uh, so really the question with the battery is what needs power and for how long? Getting a battery to back up your whole home for a significant length of time can be prohibit prohibitively expensive. And so usually, as I said, a partial home backup is selected where common elements like a few lights, some outlets for charging and the fridge are kept online while the rest of your home loses power. So when to install storage, there are two different options of storage. There's AC coupled storage and DC coupled storage. Both are really great options. It really just depends on the design of your system. In general, it is going to save you money to install solar storage at the same time as your solar panels. This is just because it saves time as far as labor costs, getting people out to your home, and also in the amount of material being needed and just designing your system to be the most efficient it can be. Storage can be added to an existing solar system, but it will cost extra. Another important thing to note is that batteries require space, and ideally your batteries are near your electrical panel. They can be put in a crawl space or crawl space, but they cannot be in a cupboard. They also can be installed outside, but may not you may not want to due to aesthetic reasons. So now um, we've gone through some of the different things you would get with your solar system. Let's talk about the incentives and how much this would cost. So the biggest incentive available to you is the solar investment tax credit. This is 30% of the total cost of your system as a dollar for dollar tax credit. The way the investment tax, so really quick, a quick disclaimer, um, I am not a tax professional. Please trust the tax professional and consult one. This is not official tax advice. That being said, here's some quick information about the investment tax credit. This, as I said, this is a 30% dollar for dollar incentive that can be applied to solar and storage. You will apply for this yourself when you um, submit your taxes for the following year. If you do not have enough tax liability, it can be claimed over several years. Um, if there are a lot of different claims about what the investment tax credit can cover. Um, one common misconception is that it can cover re-roofing if you're re-roofing before getting solar. However, this is false. Another great incentive is the Energy Trust of Oregon Solar Incentive. Energy Trust of Oregon offers $400 for PGE and $450 for Pacific Power, as well as an additional $250 per kilowatt hour of storage installed, up to $3,000 maximum per home. Um, with those are the two standard incentives that anyone can access. Outside of that, there are then two incentives that are income qualified. The first being Energy Trust of Oregon Solar Within Reach. This is an energy trust program. Mm -hmm. um, specific power customers can receive up to a dollar off per watt, up to six thousand dollars, and PGE can customers can again get a dollar off per watt, up to six thousand. Um, even if you're not low income, the house the income cutoff threshold is very generous. If you're a house of four, the income threshold is 120000 so be sure to check to see if you qualify. Second is the Oregon Department of Energy Solar and Storage Rebate. This is offered by the ODOE and can give you up to $5,000 off your solar system and up to $2,500 off your storage system. This is applied for by your solar contractor using a bid system, and there is a limited number of bids a solar contractor can have in their queue at any one time, so be sure to talk to your contractor if you'd like to access this incentive. At this time, there are only um, income qualified funds available. However, some non-income qualified funds should be coming online sometime this year. Now, before we go through some example budgets for solar, we're going to look at some, review some of the reasons costs can vary. First off, there is the size of the system, whether or not you need to regroup your home, um, whether you need to perform a structural analysis and possible upgrades, and how many incentives you can access. Next, there's why storage costs can vary. Um, 
concerning with whether or not it is installed at the same time as solar, the number of batteries you're receiving, whether you're moving part of your home to an essential load panel, whether you're installing far from the electric panel, and again, how many incentives you can access. Huh. So here is an example budget for a solar system. This is for the average size system here in Oregon, which is eight kilowatts. And we can see that the cost of four incentives for this system is $32,000. We then take the available incentives and we can see on the left um, for non-income qualified folks and for the right for income qualified, that takes your out-of-pocket cost to customer to be about $30,000 and then from there, you then get the 30% federal tax credit, which decreases your solar system cost by about by another approximately $9,000, meaning your final cost to be about $21,000. Now, if you're going to get solar and storage, so this is for an 8 kilowatt, excuse me, solar system and a 10 kilowatt hour storage. So for the cost for the system before any incentives would be $44,000. You then take the available incentives, decreasing the cost to about $37,000. And from there, you can then take the federal tax credit, making the final cost be just about $26,000 or $16,500 for income qualified households. Um, lastly, we have if you are adding storage after you've already installed solar. <coughs> Apologies. Um, so you have your cost of your solar is going to be $32,000. That's again for the eight kilowatt solar system. And then you have the cost of adding storage, 10 kilowatt hours of storage after you've already installed your solar and that is an additional 23,000. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is with the state rebate, you can only access that storage incentive if you are installing storage at the same time as solar. Therefore, this state rebate is decreasing between this slide and the previous one. So that brings your out-of-pocket cost to you to be about $50,000. And from there, you can then claim the 30% federal tax credit, bringing the total down to $35,000. Now, these are some really big numbers, so but there are options in order to financing your solar system and financing is very common. There are some loans tailored to solar that allow you to refinance after you claim your federal tax credit and your installer may have a financing partner or you can talk to your bank. So given all that great information, how do you get started? So the best way to get started is with the Energy Trust of Oregon Trade Ally Program. These are solar contractors who have been rigorously qualified and approved to offer Energy Trust of Oregon incentives. They are familiar with all Energy Trust of Oregon's design and installation requirements and are a great resource in order to find a trade ally contractor. You can request a quote using the Energy Trust of Oregon um, custom analysis and bid tool. This allows you to put in your address and receive quotes from up to three different solar contractors who work in your area. It's very easy to use and it's one of those links I put in the chat earlier. So once you, uh, sorry, once you request a quote and pick a contractor, here's what you can expect. Your contractor completes all the paperwork for you except for the tax credit. Um, the permitting here in Oregon can vary a lot depending on what area you're in. Here in Portland, it can take up to a year to get your permits approved. However, in other areas, it can take just a few weeks. Um, your installation, once you have all your permits, are only one to two days and is very quick. And your contractor will manage all inspections and interconnections in order to be sure you are getting the solar you want. Um, so that's it. I'm going to start going through the Q&A really quick. I'm going to also start the poll for the end of the webinar. But feel free to put your questions in the chat while you do that. Um, so the first question that we received was, on a garage, can panels extend above the ridge line? Um, no, they cannot. Your panels have to fit on your roof as it is um, cannot go above your um, past your roof. Part of that is for 
fire safety, if a firefighter ever needed to access your roof, there are some rules around that. And again, that is something that your sewer contractor will be very familiar with and be able to give you a few different design options on, but no, it cannot extend past your inch line. Um, this next question we got is, if I already have 10 kilowatts of PV, but no storage, can I add more kilowatts of PV along with storage and be able to get the storage incentive? Um, with that question, I honestly do not know the answer to that one. Um, so that is a great question to ask your solar installer. I would imagine the answer is yes, as you would be coupling your storage and solar together, but it's one that I am not confident on. Um, the next question was, how can we clean the roof under the panel? <clears throat> the roof under the panels really won't get any dirt or debris on it. Your panels will have um, some protective coating reaching from the side of the solar panel down to the roof in order to prevent any rodents from getting under it and help prevent leaves and other debris from getting there. Um, it's almost mesh-like, like a wire type mesh. So you don't really need to clean under the panels and really the only cleaning that your solar panels need in general is um, a quick spray of a hose every once in a while. They do not need a deep cleaning um, at all. And the next question that was received is, does the incentive apply to something other than the homeowner's primary residence? I believe that the federal tax incentive has to be taken with your primary residence and cannot be taken with a secondary residence. But as far as I know, the other incentives can be applied to other residences. And again, I am not a tax professional. That would be a great question for one of them who is more familiar and able to give you official tax advice. Another question we've got are how effective are the panels during storms, during snow and ice? So if there is snow on your panels, obviously your panels will not be able to generate any power as it won't be able to get any sun. As long as there is nothing blocking your panels, so no shade, no snow, no ice, your panels will be able to access sun. And even on a cloudy day, they do generate some power. Um, if your power is knocked out due to a snowstorm, you could reach up with a tall um, broom and maybe brush off some of that snow, but you, your panels would have to be cleared from that in order to be generating power. Um, another question we got is how much energy is lost when panels are directed for the east or west over a south facing system? Um, in order, so my answer is going to get a little bit technical for you here, but in order to access a lot of incentives, you have to be able to access, I believe it is 80% um, is the threshold of solar resource you need to have. And so your solar contractor will be able to look at that and give you your best system. But typically here in Oregon, east and west facing systems have no issues reaching that threshold and are installed often throughout the state. Um, south facing systems get the most, but it really does not make a difference at that point. The only direction that really does not get um, installed on typically our north facing systems. Um, there's also a question about Tillamook PUD not being on the list of providers within the Energy Trust program. I'm not familiar with Tillamook PUD, um, and so I can't answer that question right off the bat. If you want to put your email in the chat or reach out to me via email after, I'd be happy to look into that for you. Well, if there's no other questions, I'm happy to stay on longer, but thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. I hope you were able to get some of your questions about Sonar answered. And I please reach out if you have any further questions. My email I did put in the chat and I'll send that one more time, just all those links I mentioned. 
Um, and please reach out if you have any questions. Um, we did get one other question of, is there a list of engineering firms that specialize in analysis for solar? Um, I do not have that list top of mind, and I don't know if I've seen one before. Um, however, there, I'd assume your solar contractor does have engineers that they've worked with before and would be happy to bring in a subcontractor in order to help you with that or at least give you some recommendations. Um, is there a rating system for the quality of contractor? Was just asked. Um, the only rating system I know of is whether or not they are a trade ally. All the trade allies have been heavily vetted. As with any um, contractor, it's always good to do your due diligence, ask for reviews, ask, ask for recommendations, search them online and be sure that they are quality and are people that you want working on your home. There's a lot of different systems and things you might want to consider, including whether you prefer a large contractor or a small, more mom and pop shop, um, some um, morals and values and things of that nature. But in general, if they're on the trade ally list, they are a um, good contractor. As I said, if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm happy to stay as long as needed in order to answer any. Oh, Zoom won't allow a copy of the link from the chat. Um, I will have to take that up from Zoom. I do not, I'll try to put those in the chat directly to you and see if that works. But um, all these links can also be fine found on our website. And as I said, you can always email me with any question and be happy to answer them. Mm. Thank you everyone for coming and I hope you have a great day. Oh, yes, one last question. Will this presentation be posted somewhere? Yes, this was recorded. This presentation will be posted to our YouTube channel. Assuming you found this through the Eventbrite and signed up through there, you will get an email once that video is live. It should be in the next week or so. Mm -hmm.